Okay. Thank you guys for being here and allowing us this opportunity to present. Um, again, my name is Giselle Bazan. Um, I'm just going to go through our team. We had an extensive team who assisted with this, um, with this study. Um, myself was a lead investigator for this IRB approved study. And then we have Dr. Rooney who helped us, was very instrumental as a mentor in teaching us how research happens because we are very novice. This is my first time doing this, so I was very green. Um, and then we had Kelsey Sawyer, um, which she was just introduced, and Tiffany Patterson. And uh, we've had, we did have two bedside nurses, um, one from medical ICU, one from cardiac ICU, one Bowie Kamau. And she's here, she's waving at me. And then we also had Michelle Bradbury, she's charged nurse on medical ICU, who were very passionate to help out their fellow coworkers um, during, um, during the height of COVID um, with this study. Um, also, we had um, Cindy Grissman, which is the nurse manager for the cardiac ICU. She was a big part of the protocol development of this IRB approved study, as well as Dr. Sahar Mindaus, which we utilized as a consultant. Uh, for a lot of information and we gathered a lot of information from her. She has a wealth of knowledge as well. And of course, Dr. Long um, really helped us. She did a lot of our statistical analysis, lots of great guidance and mentoring um, throughout this process. So our study was over the mindfulness impact on um, nurse burnout. Um, <clears throat> so the background significance of this study was during um, 2020, um, two departments um, were initially selected at Covenant Medical Center to become the initial COVID floors as cardiac ICU and medical ICU departments. Um, and as we uh, hope you guys are familiar is that um, nurses caring for COVID infected two patients um, during the height 20 had higher than unusual levels of burnout. Statistically, not only that, but we were able to identify those within our caregivers. And I'm going to pass the mic over to Kelsey. This was kind of her section. I kind of kept going, so <laughs> I got a little excited. Okay, so as Giselle led into it, um, nurses that cared for SARS-CoV-2 infected patients during the height of the 2020 pandemic did experience higher than normal levels of burnout. I'm sure many of you saw lots and lots of um, articles, news reports, things like that of all of the devastation happening across the nursing world. So. That's kind of what led us into this research project. So prevalence of nurse burnout can be as high as 40%, uh, which is extremely high for a profession. Higher levels of burnout can have a negative effect on job satisfaction, patient outcomes, and increase nursing absenteeism and turnover. So how much you love your job how much you come to your job, and if you're gonna stay there or not, burnout can affect that. Mindfulness-based stress reduction programs have been utilized, and there is no gold standard for primary outcomes for nursing mental health. So this study took a whole bunch of different things from literature to um, try and figure out what works what is gonna help these nurses decrease that 40% of burnout. Um, intensive care unit nurses have reported the highest rates of burnout, particularly because of the types of patients that they see and um, the very critical patients that come in and the futile care sometimes that ends up happening with these patients. Um, and studies have demonstrated strong relationships between nurse work environments and job satisfaction, work-related burnout, and intent to leave. So not only did we want to look at burnout, but we also wanted to look at the environment that these nurses were practicing in to see if that had any effect on um, their stress levels and their um, burnout. So our research question, after looking at all of the evidence out there, is what effects does a mindfulness bundle toolkit have on Maslow burnout inventory, nurse work index, and stress arousal checklist scores in nurses working in critical care units designated for the care of SARS-CoV-2 patients? So now I'm going to hand it over to Tiffany, and she's going to go over the methodology.
So how do we make it work? So what do we do to help these nurses and how do we put this whole program together? So we did a quantitative quasi-experimental repeated measures design um, with the IRB approved study. We did have to go through um, the full Providence St. Joseph Health IRB process. It's a new thing to me as well. As a novice, I did not know what all that included. It's a lot of paperwork. Um, the intervention groups consisted of those two ICUs that Giselle mentioned, so the CICU and the MICU over at Covenant Medical Center. Those nurses were experiencing obviously higher than normal levels of stress and exhaustion based on the patient population that they were caring for. Um, got to witness a lot of that firsthand um, talking with some of those nurses. So the study participants it consisted of 52, which was a convenient sample from those two ICUs, um, which seemed like a small group of people, but that's who we got to help commit, which is hard during the height of a pandemic and you're stressed out. So we were grateful to have those 52. We did a 12-week mindfulness bundle toolkit. So the toolkit included of a whole bunch of research that we looked at all different types of programs and opportunities to provide these nurses that wouldn't be too overwhelming, wouldn't take a lot of time, and would make this something that they would enjoy and reflect on and be able to do even just in their day-to-day -day getting ready for work. So some of these things that we did. The interventions included approximately one to one and a half hours per week for a total of six weeks. Um, they included a lot of different things. So you see this cool little word cloud that we made. But we did a two, actually, therapeutic rooms where the staff could go in and take time to relax, decompress, enjoy some snacks. Snacks are always good for nurses. It had some blue lights, some different things that we looked at in the research was blue lights and um, green space, um, music. Therapy. So there was lots of different offerings in just that room. A massage chair, um, which I need. Oh, the yoga mat. There was a yoga mat in there. I'm trying to think what else was in there. Um, lots of great things. So just different opportunities for those nurses to kind of go and relax and decompress. I need to go hang out in the massage chair. And then we also had this really cool course. We all thought when we first jumped in on this this mindfulness class and we're like oh, are they gonna like it is that gonna be enjoyable and will they go y'all this class was amazing I I only got to go to one of them but just seeing the different things that you can do just at the bedside in a chair at the desk when you're charting and documenting to, to kind of de-stress and help yourself stretch or relax a little bit was amazing um, the, the instructor for that course, phenomenal. I would recommend her time and time again. So the staff did get attend that and they had great attendance. And they even mentioned um, seeing people doing these stretches and things in the unit, which we didn't report, but there's your side note. Um, another thing we did, we created this little booklet. So they had six weeks of reflection and there were different things, like great encouraging words or little actions that they could do, like, hey, tell somebody they did a great job today, or reach out to someone and um, see if they need anything today. Just little actions that are super simple that take less than five seconds that anyone could do so that it wouldn't be a burden on their day because we all know we don't need one more thing to do. Um, the data was collected at three different time periods throughout the study, and then a descriptive analysis was conducted on all study variables. So we did check on all of them. We went through all of those pieces of paper. And then um, normality was examined for interval level dependent variables. Giselle's next. Do I need to stop? No, okay. Keep going. No. okay, sorry. I know they're having issues with hearing on the streaming. Um, so analysis and results, thank you Tiffany, that was great. So we collected all this data on paper and um, our nice um, lovely um, friend and mentor Dr. Long ran the data analysis and what we ran was a one-way repeated measure analysis of variance um, ANOVA for those of you um, that don't know 
and was conducted to determine the effects of the mindfulness bundle to toolkit on the emotional exhaustion, um, the personal accomplishment, which is PA, and depersonalization, which is DP. Those are all three subscales of the Maslow burnout inventory that was mentioned in the research question. Okay, so that's where those live, that's where those, um, that terminology came from. And then as well as the nurse work index and then the stress arousal scores. So the results of the analysis did indicate a statistically significant effect from the mindfulness bundle um, on frontline nurses and the two areas that we're talking about, which is the CICU, cardiac ICU, and the medical ICU department. So there was a significant effect on emotional exhaustion at the 0.005 number and there was a small leaning towards moderate effect size on emotional exhaustion. Depersonalization um, had a um, statistically significant effect the 0.007 and a small effect size of 0.16 and then the stress skill had a um, statistical significance, that's hard to say three times, <laughs> um, statistical significance um, to the 0.005 level with a um, small effect size. So some of the discussions implications that we concluded was that, you know, we realized that there's no standard practice guidelines available to measure and mitigate mental health. As Kelsey mentioned, um, and through the literature review and literature search, I've learned that there's a lot of studies out there. There's a lot of studies that want to help mitigate with mindf uh, mindfulness and burnout in nurses. However, no one's using the same measuring instrument. Some are using the um, Maslow burnout inventory. Some are using the nurse work index, but there's not a standard practice. There's not a standard guideline. So it's really hard for us to know true values or to run meta-analysis on these studies to know the true effectiveness of, um, of the studies and, and the results. And then there was also inconsistencies found on mindfulness-based programs. So what ours was, was we kind of took a little bit and piece from every study that we saw um, because what we learned through our research and literature reviews that not one size fits all, okay? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to provide all the nurses with the opportunity to kind of pick and choose. We wanted them to apply to all of them, but we knew that some may really enjoy yoga, some may really enjoy a massage chair, some may really enjoy music, but we wanted to offer all of them to them and, um, and see the effects that, that, that those instruments would have, those interventions. Um, the interventions were fairly easy to implement. We did have support from administration. We had lots of support from them. Um, they were more than willing to assist us with this program. Dr. Rooney was there with me as we presented and they were so much, uh, so supportive of what we needed to do. And this, this program is not just limited to COVID. <laughs> I know. This program is not just limited to COVID um, two nurses. Um, and it's low cost. It wasn't, other than sending the nurses to the two hour mindfulness class, it was really uh, low cost. Um, we did pay for the rooms. We did have the rooms and the massage chairs. But other than that, there really was no cost. And then I'm going to let Kelsey take over the conclusions. You got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some of the conclusions that we gathered after this amazing project. Um, our study findings suggest that the use of a 12-week mindfulness bundle toolkit is effective to mitigate emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and stress linked to burnout in critical care nurses. That's huge, guys. I mean, anything that we can do to help these nurses get through the things that they are doing and seeing every single day, and it doesn't cost anything, that's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Um, significant effects were not found from the mindfulness bundle toolkit on the measures of personal accomplishment, stress, and arousal scores. Um, it was something that we measured, but we just didn't see quite that level on the statistics that we were hoping for for it to be significant. There was a change, but not that significance that we needed. 
Replication of the intervention with a larger randomized sample is recommended. So that's one of the limitations of our study is that it was somewhat small. We had 52 nurses um, participate and it wasn't randomized because we had 52 nurses. Um, so if we could get a larger randomized sample and really recreate these results, it would be much stronger. Um, although not reported, nurses did express appreciation for the interventions. Like Tiffany said, um, Giselle and I saw people in the hallways practicing their stretches a day or two after these classes. So, and coming up to us and talking about how they loved them. So getting into the qualitative data will be really interesting later on down the road. <laughs> um, SARS-CoV-2 highlighted the burnout nurses globally had been experiencing for years. Um, this may have contributed to the Mindfulness Bundle Toolkit being embraced so wholeheartedly by these nurses that we were studying. Um, I already kind of talked about the limitation of it not being randomized and it having a small sample size. The other limitation that we did notice for our study was um, we didn't have a control group for our um, T2 and T3. So um, that would be something that we would suggest for further studies is to be able to compare them to the other groups. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Kelsey was mentioning how the appreciation and some of the verbalization we got this room although was available and we wanted it to be utilized by the people in the units, just FYI, a lot of our doctors enjoyed the rooms, especially of our intensivists that were in those COVID ICU floors. Um, and then some of our other, um, like, um, what do you call them? Assisted staff, such as respiratory therapists, they were open to use that room as well. And they really enjoyed those rooms. So it wasn't, I mean, although the majority of the interventions were applied, they're all applied to the nurses. Um, we, it was open, that room was open available to help those. And my, my, what I would like to see is what effects this would have if implementing this would have on retention of nurses, especially these new nurses that are looking to leave the profession, um, not just the organization, but the profession itself. You know, I know we've all had lots of turnaround um, lately with travel, but you know, um, I would be interested to see what <clears throat> what implementing a program like this and being consistent. That's another thing is being consistent. I, I would really would like to go back and visit and have training again and have it open and available. I have a really big project in mind. I just don't know how that's how to get that dream going. I have somebody over here looking at me that I discussed that with who's thinking that's a really great idea. But um, because it's if you don't if you don't use it, you lose it. So if we're not encouraging our caregivers to consistently practice mindfulness and refocus on that, just like we do training regularly on skills, this is another skill set that we need to make sure that we're encouraging them to apply. Um, I think that's another focus that in future studies that we need to look at as well as implementing um, some type of refresher, reminders, and encouragement from leadership as well. Questions? Friends. Sharing it with friends. All of our nurses. So. What are some of the barriers from your personal experience for frontline nurses engaging in research since we know that this is something that we, we need to increase the uptake on? Reflecting on what you've learned, what would you, if you were sharing with frontliners who wanted to do a study, what kind of words of wisdom might you have for them? You know, some of the conversations I've had with some new nurses who a lot, a big thing is they have to, uh, they've interested about, as soon as I get out, I can't wait till I can pick up shifts. I always have to tell them, you need to self-reflect. You need to check in, you need to self-reflect. And that's kind of where I encourage on the, my unit to make sure they go into this room and they reflect. And I think that's some of the barriers with, is that they're busy. They're really busy. Um, and I tell them that they need to make sure that they're checking in with themselves mentally, emotionally, and they need to be able to um, have those limits, set those limits within themselves, knowing when they're burned out, knowing what it looks like to them. Do you have anything else to add? It's not as scary as it looks. 
I would just say um, be encouraged that you have support. So I think we've had nothing but support, even being new to the whole research realm. Like I went to some random research class and I got kind of got hooked in trying to figure this out and learn about it. Just being open to learning new things, I think, is the biggest barrier for those new nurses. That's not so scary that you do have support and that we need to better um, the places that we work and the care for our patients. It's not just about numbers on a screen. It's about the impact on the patients that we take care of. Um, I would echo Tiffany's. It's not as scary as it seems, but research coming into it, not knowing very much about it, does seem very daunting. Um, because you always think about these big, huge projects that have come out and it doesn't have to be that big. Um, this didn't start out big and it turned into something that can be really impactful for nurses everywhere. So yeah, it can be something super simple. Questions from the audience? I can make an observation because one of my units happened to be one of the units involved in the study and uh, my burnout scores from our caregiver engagement surveys actually improved over the one year. So that's a, that's a good outcome for me and my retention has been better. So I can give them kudos to that. So, yeah. Other questions? Yes. <laughs> Although we did recruit members from the units, these two units to participate, they, if they were working on the floor, they were still offered the opportunity to participate in all the interventions without being part of the study. So we didn't want to shut anybody out um, from what was needed and we were fully aware of it. So we did open up the interventions, the classes, the rooms to anybody that was working on the unit. Um, just so that they could have that help with burnout. And a lot of times the people that we have, <laughs> a, lot of, uh, a lot of the people that were um, participating in the study or who were not participating in the study or were the ones who needed it the most we knew. Um, so I think a lot of it was fear. I think a lot of it was denial. I think some of them, they, they don't wanna seem weak. I feel like th that, some of the, that some of the things we heard like, oh, I'm fine, I don't, I don't need this intervention or I don't wanna be part of the study. And I was like, okay, well, you don't have to be part of the study, but you can still have all the interventions apply to you. You know, you can still, taboo, you can still do That's all the, word the they things. Used. Yeah, it was taboo, yes. In the literature, it stated how it was taboo um, to identify when you need help. You know, and I think that was a big thing with COVID. We all learned, we, we heard about that in the media. You know, no one, no one suffers alone. You know, and I think um, having this available to them, they would talk about in the unit. They love the recliner. I know that our massage chair, in the next two years needs to be replaced because that's how much use it's had, okay? So the, the departments really loved it, yeah. so. So anecdotal from my unit, um, it's really opened them up to talking more about their mental health and being more open with each other about, I'm not okay. And let's talk about it and see if you're not okay with me. <laughs> because they all kind of understand like, now we have these things that we can do, let's be better together. So I, it, I think it's brought them closer. Yeah, probably the youngest one. People say that you need a timeout, so go take your time out and I'll watch your patients. You know? Well, and it, I mean, it's an amazing place to be able to walk up to one of your nurses and be like, I can see that you're overwhelmed. I will watch your patients go take 15 minutes and just be away from wherever and whatever is going on. So it's, it's an it's okay. amazing opportunity. Yeah, and it's okay. Yeah, and it's accepted. I would like to say from the onset I have to look at you because you brought everybody else along, including all of us. But from the onset, Giselle had a, a vision based on what she saw in practice and seeing what our nurses were going through and just some of the background that wasn't necessarily said. And if you don't know, Giselle was over 
the ed this nurse's education on the unit that was the COVID unit from day one of the pandemic, the COVID ICU at that, so the sickest of the sick. And so what Giselle was seeing in her staff every day, she's like, I've got to do something. And my very first question to her was, do you want it to be QI or do you want it to be research? And we really had a conversation about quality improvement versus research. And she clearly said, I want it to be research. And I had to say, well, you know, research isn't necessarily a marathon. It's a sprint. I mean, not a sprint. It's a marathon. The other direction. I wish, I wish it was that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> quality improvement doesn't have all these extra rules around it. But I would say Giselle's heart from the very beginning of this was to make it better for the nurses that I can say I've honestly never seen the looks on some of their faces in all my 33 years of nursing. And as a military veteran in healthcare, a military nurse at that, 30 de uh, three deployments, not 30, but three deployments even, Panama, Desert Storm, and Germany. I was in Germany on 9-11. I watched our faces when the, the World Trade Centers were attacked. They still never compared to the looks I see on your staff as they're walking out to go home for the day. And so I just commend you, Giselle, for your big idea too, because wanting to spread and help everyone. And I think that it's, it's really truly a vision that was so important, but it stemmed from compassion and a true need for nursing that we're seeing right now. And before this started, Dr. Long even mentioned, I think, middle management and, and executives. I've never seen burnout go up the chain as high as it has, have y'all? I mean, we're now seeing the burnout impact on our managers and our, our C-suite, our chief nursing officers. We're seeing this burnout go up and down the chain, which is just totally not new to us. And so, thank you, first of all, thank you for your vision, thank you for pulling a team together. And I don't even know if you want to speak to how you pulled your team together. I mean, that may be something that somebody that's never done research may not have an idea how to pull a team together. I don't know what happened. I winked and they just all showed up. That's all that happened. It's, I mean, honestly, it was just, I really just wanted to do something. I just wanted to do something, and being in the educator role for as long as I have, I was like, well, I want to see if it's effective. Well, little did I know that that's a research study, because I was so green, I'm not lying. So <clears throat> talking to Jamie about it, and I was like, no, I don't want to wait this long. I, don't, I was really impatient, though. I had to learn lots of patience. I know the rest of my team realized that, too. Um, we had, like I said, two bedside nurses who were there on the floor who saw it. They weren't part of the study, They, but... Um, they were able to talk about and help assist and guide with our interventions and let us know what they're seeing as well. And so I had to, one nurse to represent each unit. And then I had, we did collect some data from um, two other units in our little house, this, our little house, our little house little um, the little people at Lakeside, <laughs> um, women's and children's. And then we, Dr. Rooney, which is our, um, our research, um, expert at Covenant, and of course Dr. Long, our statistician. And then we had uh, Randall, because Randall's very big on evidence base. That's like his passion. Um, and so Randall helped do a lot of the vetting for interventions for us. And Dr. Menhendaus, uh, she had previously done studies on burnout um, with the environment. And so we kind of brought her in, um, kind of as a consultation, consultation and asking her about what she utilized instrument-wise for her study and kind of took bits and pieces from her. So we used her a lot as well. And then Cindy Grissman, of course, was the manager because she was recognizing this, and so she was a really big driving force in this as well. Um, and then Kelsey came in to help us with our analysis, data entry, um, and you know, medical ICU was one of her floors, so she kind of saw the whole thing come to life, um, but she was brought in later. But it was just, a, it, it wasn't hard. It wasn't hard to find a team because there was a need. So if you see a need um, and out there, it's not hard to find people who are interested to help. You know, if there is a need and you can identify it, I guarantee you that you're going to find other people with like minds who feel the same need and are compassionate about it as well. So it wasn't really hard to get the team together. It was just knowing 
who you needed on the team, which I learned throughout. Um, but it, it wasn't difficult to get a team together. Oh, okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Word about um, the literature says that one of the main barriers to frontline nurses engaging in research, this is what the literature says, why we don't do it, is that frontline nurses say, I don't have time to do research. I simply that's don't have I time. I knew so, that's what you were going for. <laughs> but but it's, it's exactly what the evidence says. The evidence says this is why nurses won't do it. They perceive they do not have the time for it. What would you, as frontliners and as Educators, what would you say to nurses now that you see the power of what you've learned from engaging in research? What would you say to them? What advice would you give them? Kelsey. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, yeah, just do it. <laughs> if it's something you're passionate about, it's not hard, hard to find the time. Um, that's that's really the biggest part about it because Giselle and I have had I don't know how many conversations about the things that we saw on our units happening during COVID. Um, so it wasn't hard to set the time aside to do this study because it was something we were passionate about and we knew was needed for not only our units but Hopefully it could benefit people, nurses everywhere. I mean, it wasn't just, um, yep. <laughs> it wasn't just um, another project to do. That's, I feel like that's very different um, than if it's something that really means something to you. And I really think as a researcher, you should be mindful of the population you're choosing especially if you're wanting to utilize frontline nurses. Um, because as our conclusion states that because of the burnout and what was happening with COVID, it wasn't difficult for us to have buy-in from our nurses to participate in the study. We had a few no's, but we had a majority of yeses. Um, but we have the appropriate pop, um, you know, patient population, or not patient, but the um, population, you know, um, for nurses to do that. So I think it's, as a researcher, it is important to reflect on and when you select your group, you know, that you want to apply the intervention to. So that's also something I would recommend as a researcher um, because that's where you would probably get more bang for your buck. You know, you'll have better outcomes. You'll have better numbers, better results. Um, so I would just be mindful of that as a researcher. Response from um, your chief nursing officer, Karen Baggerly. No. <laughs> you, you expected the. No. I, I really wasn't. Um, <clears throat> I was actually. I wasn't surprised. I, I was. I, I was really grateful. Um, I was really grateful, but I think this was a conversation that we had already kind of had on the side note. Um, I think I was already wanting to apply, bringing people in, you know, and having some type of intervention um, applied before I knew it was <clears throat> research and I had to do something and I had to get, and I had to get consent, I had to get consent, but um, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't surprised by the support we had. Um, I know when we spoke to Karen about it, she said, yes, that was a conversation we've had from um, the higher, you know, the execs, you know, from, from that office, from that, um, so, those were conversations, things that they were already looking at. So it was just timely. Um, I do, the only thing I do, you know, feel unfortunate for was that it was only limited to the two departments um, at that time. Um, we had to control it. I, I was only, you know, even though I had a great team, we were still busy with other things as well. So we, we had to limit the size of our intervention group. The other questions or comments from the group? Well, please join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> and uh, on behalf of um, Lover Christian, we're so proud of you. But um, 
no, no good thing happens in isolation. And what we see here, you know, reflects the leadership, you know, of the organization of which they're a part. It reflects the leadership commitment of time, you know, of mentors, you know, of, of many who have poured into making this reality for you and now it's, it's fanning out to make a difference in your organization. I think we can really be proud of the region in which we're in, the city in which we're in, where we try to pull together. You can see it doesn't have to be huge to make a big difference. So give, the, give them one more round of applause. <laughs> and thank you for being here. And I have just one announcement in follow-up that fits really well with today's program. I have one.